1 Corinthians this morning, chapter 11. Uh, excited about getting into the Word this morning. Um, and uh, we, are, we are continuing in our series on 1 Corinthians. Had several uh, pastor friends of mine um, kind of shake their head. Kind of, what are you talking about? You're doing a Corinthian series? Man, that's kind of um, uh, unique because it's not something that you, you would typically go through and from the pulpit, you would you would literally bring out little spots here and there. But um, I, I felt like the Lord wanted us to get the whole the whole package. Uh, so here we are, I guess, week 17 or 16. I'm not sure which it is, but uh, Paul is writing in first Corinthians and he is laying it out plain and simple in chapter one and following. He's dealing with division in the church. And here we are all the way into chapter 11, and he is still dealing with division in the church. And so we find it um, unique this morning that we get to be able to open up the Word of God. Find You can find out when you read in the Scriptures, uh, when you become a student of the Word and you start opening up and you start reading, uh, you begin to understand the mindset, the characteristic, the attitude of the writer and uh, we, we find Paul here who's writing the church that he planted. Um, he's writing this letter to them. They're in a mess. The church at Corinth would be, you know, kind of like the church uh, in Myrtle Beach. Uh, you know, uh, not that we are struggling with all of the same issues that Corinth is dealing with. Uh, to that degree, it's not probably as bad as it was then um, as it would be now. Uh, they were dealing with... Um, you know, perversion, uh, you know, yes, we are, but we, we got to, when you read the scriptures, you realize that it was so rampant and so bad that folks like you and I in the body of Christ was coming to the pastor and saying, asking just bizarre questions like, should my wife and I abstain in the bedroom uh, because the perversion of sex in the, in the city? Uh, if you were to come and ask me that, I would look at you like you're crazy. Uh, but, but that was the mindset. This was a church uh, that we got to remember now. They did not have the Gospels for uh, like we have. They were not written yet. Paul was, was giving it to them and laying it out to uh, as the Spirit of God was giving it. But the Gospels had not been written at this time. So they did not have a Bible to open up and, and go, oh my goodness, how about this? It wasn't like that. So we are privileged and blessed to have that opportunity. But we got to remember that when we read the scriptures, we have to read it in the context of the circumstance and the situation of that time. Does it apply today? Absolutely. But we're going to find in the first 16 verses of chapter 11 that, and I'm not even going to even deal with those verses this morning. We're going to jump to chapter 7 or verse 17 because in this particular situation Paul was dealing in verses uh, 2 through 16 Paul was dealing with uh, the cultural issue the Jewish women wore a head covering when they came to church and the Greek women that were not Jews they did not and there was a big scandal there was a big fight there was a big division in the church about that and they were arguing about it and he just got through talking uh, about about having freedom uh, s balanced with responsibility and that yes you're free in Christ but it is also not good for us to offend our brother in Christ so he was telling them you're not commanded to wear a head covering but you don't also want to offend your brother or sister in Christ so all of that is dealt with and in that ver those verses aren't really dealing with the woman's role in the church or the woman it's dealing with the attitude of worship that they had towards God's word towards the Lord's Supper they were literally combining themselves together and they called it the agape feast and they would bring the rich of the of the uh, of the church would bring in this big old you know fried turkey and and uh, mac and cheese and homemade biscuits, cat head with the gravy. And they were bringing it in and they were having a good time and eating. But the Bible said that there was division 
literally they were calling it the agape feast or the love feast and they were eating this food while those in the same church did not have anything to bring were standing over here watching them gorge themselves and literally getting drunk according to the scriptures that we read and they were people without anything and on the other side of the church people with everything eating it degrading those that did not have not sharing what they had thinking themselves to be high and mighty and then they had it all going on because they brought the turkey and you didn't you brought spam now if you're in here and you eat spam there's no offense to that because i have spam sandwiches before i care not to eat them any longer because of the amount of time i ate them as i was a kid but the turkey and they brought the spam they brought not even spam it was like those little canned vienna sausages you know the ones that the teenagers like to eat man I, I, the only thing i hate about those things other than the fact it's not real meat um is it takes it's so hard to get them out you open the pop it and you try to get them out the juice drains out and you're slamming it on the counter trying to get them things out and you dig your finger in there and you tear them all up and they're not good anymore so you know whatever so there was a lot of division in the church and funny enough it revolved around food but they were taking abuses and this whole book is talking about being strong or united together under the lordship of Jesus Christ and at the end of chapter 10 it couples with the first verse of chapter 11 and he says, Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, he wasn't saying this to be boastful. Remember, they did not have the Gospels. They did not, they did not know uh, what yet to, to have in front of them. So Paul said, you've trusted me for several years now. You've watched me. You know that I, I'm doing everything I can to listen to the voice of the Lord. Just, just follow me. And Paul was saying this, as I and following Christ and so we find in those verses verses 2 through 16 that you are welcome to go back and read but it does not really it bases itself on the cultural issues of that day and so we're gonna kind of overlook that for a little while and we're gonna jump to 17 if you don't like that I skip verses 1 to 16 let's come have a talk at the end of the service and I'll be happy to share with you the more detailed reasons of why. But for now, we're going to look at verse 17. Some of y'all are like, well, who's going to come talk to preacher? Don't worry about it. It's all good. So he picks up in verse 17. He says, but in the following instructions, I do not command or commend you. I'm not going to praise you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. What he's saying here is that when God's people come to church, they're not leaving better than when they came in. That, that's, that would be a nightmare for a pastor, that you come to church and then you do not get encouraged or get something from God's word that you can carry with you through the week that can minister to your spirit. And he said, for in the first place, when you follow along with me, when you come together as a church now he's talking about the local church that yes we can uh, we can lump in the universal church here but he's talking about this church in this moment I hear that there are divisions among you and I believe it in part he said I, I, I got I got to probably believe that because I've I've witnessed for there must be factions small cliques in the larger church small cliques within the church among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized so he's dealing with the the cliques that were in the church he did not like that he it it was a it was a back distraction of for disunity you know what distraction is right distraction is has anybody watched the, the, the newest, latest magician named Shin Lim? Nobody? Okay, great. 
I'm going to explain to you who this dude is. He's about this tall, and he is one of, they say, he's one of the greatest uh, close-up magicians to ever, to has ever been. Um, I, I feel like it's sorcery, uh, but to, because it's just creepy, but this guy will have, in your, he prides himself with sitting in front of all of the people, zooming in, looking, his sleeves are rolled up, he's doing all this, and he's talking, and he's got this weird hair thing, you know, he's, and he he's, does this to the camera, and he just does this little smolder. You know, Caleb, what I'm talking about yet? He does this, that's how he won over his wife, he got the smolder. And so she and Lim's doing all this stuff, and he'll write on a, a, a playing card, and he'll put it in your pocket. And he'll be doing all this stuff, and he's, and while he's doing all this, all that's distraction for the trick to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. And then somehow, in the midst of all this, that card is now in your back pocket with the same inscription and, and he'll do some kind of math equation and he'll write the answer on the card before you even said the answer. And there it is. And he's distracted everybody. And I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking about distraction. I was thinking about how the enemy is the wizard master. He is the, he is the superman of distraction. He is the, the greatest distractor of all time, Satan. And millions and millions are tuned in. Now, y'all going to go home and YouTube this dude named Shin Lim. He's trippy, man, I'm telling you. And, and you think you know what he's doing, but he's distracted you. He's been on Penn and Teller a few times, and they've told him don't come back because we can't figure it out because I think it's sorcery. Anyway, moving on. So he's doing all this. And if this little dude can distract millions and millions in his feeble self, in his humanness, kind of broken down guy, how much more can the enemy, who is the master of distraction, while you're looking over here distracted by whether a woman ought to wear a hat in church when she prays, all the while there's little cliques, divisions in the church that are being overlooked. And Paul said, uh-uh, no, no, no. We're going to address it all. And so we find here in verse 19, he says, There's little factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. He's talking about what we, what we share when we do our communion and, and we all get together. And if you've been here long enough, you know we, we take it very seriously. We incorporate it into worship. We don't just blow through it and get it out of the way. It's something that we, we remember what it was for. These guys were coming, getting fat, getting drunk, eating and partying, having a great time, and nothing was being accomplished. No remembrance was being, was being given. He says, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. This guy's over here chowing down on their steak and potato. They're not waiting on everybody else. He says, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. And then in verse 22, you can tell some of his attitude. What? Don't you have a house where you can eat this? Can't you go home and do this drink? Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? He's asking this question, what shall I say to you? You want me to tell you what I think? Shall I commend you? Shall I praise you for this? I don't think so. Paul was a little miffed. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. He's referring to Matthew 26. Beautiful passage of scripture where, he, where, he, where he's, he's dealing with his disciples, going in there. And I won't get into all that right now, but he says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it, talking about the bread. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. What does that even mean? 
do this as often as often as you drink in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner just like they were doing they were calling it the Lord's Supper but they were coming over here and they're getting fat getting drunk they were not even paying attention to the needs of those who they were worshiping with in the same body of believers he says you do this you're doing this and woe be to you that do this let each person examine himself and then so eat the bread and drink the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself that's heavy words that is why many of you are weak many of you are sick and you're ill and some of you have even died because you're abusing what the remembrance of the Lord's Supper is and he says but if we judge ourselves truly we would not be judged but when we are judged by the Lord we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world so then my brothers knowing that he is talking to the believer when you come together to eat wait for one another tarry be patient if anyone is hungry let him eat at home so that when you come together it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I get there I almost titled this message check yourself before you wreck yourself verse 18 let's go back to it let's break these verses down for just a moment and I won't be long this morning oh I've got 30 minutes so that means it's 1130 I'll try to keep myself as unanimated as possible as I'm excited this morning about the word let's look it says as a church one of the great uh, verses that we could find proof of the uh, of the uh, of the existence of a local body a local church this was being addressed to the people at Corinth to this particular church he says I hear that there's divisions among you there's there's little clicks among you now I know it's hard it's difficult when a church we didn't have clicks when there was five of us we didn't have divisions when there was you me and the, and the kids and then um, another family came along still no no clicks but then it began to grow 15 and what you do with 15 you, you got to change things because when you get 30 and 40 and 50 you can't do the same things you did when you had 10 15 you got to change it and those in all of that process people start not liking the way you do things and there's divisions and little clicks they don't like the song you sing I'm sorry we're not singing to you get over it I, they said I'm a Slytherin I don't know what that means <laughs> that's the whole Harry Potter thing I'm sorcery as well in the name of Jesus but that seems to be the driver mentality but we've got to understand that in a group this size now there's probably just maybe under a hundred in here this morning uh, there's going to be folks that are going to associate more with others this wasn't what he was talking about he was talking about literally people that were wealthy in the church bringing their food eating it and looking at the others who are standing on the other side with nothing that's jacked up he was he was breaking it down and saying you need to learn to take care of the church family of which you are worshiping first Corinthians 10 we read this last week let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor I mean it's awesome to have an uh, a cause it's awesome to have thing we ought to minister in our community and we ought to minister globally and we ought to minister in those areas but I went to college with a guy when I was in seminary and we stayed <clears throat> we stayed in a it was a they call it the Mary dorms and uh, we were the last to enroll and uh, there was no more places to stay it was a what would you say honey the 15 by 20 basement it was the basement it's where they kept the 
uh, refrigerant tanks and the oxygen or for whatever reason and uh, you know all that stuff and and so our friends went in and they cleaned it up for us and we moved in and I was so embarrassed for her mom and dad to come and visit because you know here she lived in this nice house had a nice bedroom now she's living in a cinder block block wall you know you could literally sit on the couch and get something out of the refrigerator and never move Drop the soap in the shower. You had to get out of the shower to pick up the soap and get back in it. It was tiny. I have no idea where I was going with this story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we had some friends that cleaned it up for us and took care of it and, and moved us in. And they, they watched out for us. Talking about taking care of your church family this morning. People tell me needs. I need you to pray for this. I need you to pray for that. And, and we're ministering to the communities, but right where we are worshiping, there's people with needs. And we don't want to ignore the needs of the people that are worshiping on your row and go focus on all of this and somebody over here is starving. There's folks in here this morning that don't know if they're going to be married in six months. There's folks in here this morning that don't know where their next paycheck's going to come. There's folks in here this morning that, that are, 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 are just devastated by this flood. And we, what would we do if we are stood over here and do our thing and, and let's do this and let's do that and let's, let, let's let do all these things that ultimately can be seen but not take care of the person that's sitting next to me. In church we got to have a balance can I get an amen and so we find that Paul is describing this verse say let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor this morning a family came to me this morning and we've been praying for a place for them to they had to move out because of certain circumstances uh, beyond their control and that usually how it works and they are they are outdoors people and they love they love to spend time and it just happens to be that time of year where it's time to roll that out and they were like we're praying for a camper not necessarily to own but something that we can use for temporary time while we find a house and so I said, I'll be praying. And so we've been praying for several weeks now. This morning, another member or covenant partner, we don't want to use member, it's not a country club, right, Aaron? Another covenant partner in this body of believers said, you know what? I've been thinking about this. is talking to my wife, and we got this camper. And, you know, it's livable, and uh, we're just thinking about donating. I was like, stop what you're saying right now. And I ran and I said, you guys got to come talk to this guy right now. There's a need that is about to be met. And he said, you use it as much as you need it. And if, you know, at the end when it's all done and said and done, we'll, maybe we'll hang on to it and use it for another need or we'll, we'll donate it to the Red Cross. We'll do whatever. But someone in the local church met another need for someone in the same local church. There's dozens of stories like that. I could tell you story after story about somebody last week walked up to me and gave me some cash and said, I want to trust you to hand this out to somebody that needs it this week. And so we did that. I don't particularly want you to come up and hand me cash, put an envelope on it, let's mark it, and let's do that so that I'm, I'm, I have accountability as well. But there's, Paul is trying to say you need to deal with the whole scope of things. Verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. And then he starts to break down. He breaks down the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And so this morning, I'm going to do a little bit of that. This morning, we're going to talk about the doctrine of justification or the teaching of justification. We're going to talk about the doctrine of sanctification. Some 
imperative, some important big words that I'm going to break down for, for us this morning and talk about the beauty of it. He says, and when he given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you, and I don't want you to ever forget it. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. None of us want to be known for how we died. None of us. We want to be known for how we lived, but not the Savior. Oh, no. He wanted to be known for why he died. First Peter 2 says, He himself bore our sins, our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds or his stripes, you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. The why he died. He wanted us to remember why he died. But God commends his love toward us. Romans 5, 8 is the how. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This ain't a running church, but if that was to be a good verse to run on right there. <laughs> Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. You and I, Jesus died on a rugged cross for the sins of the world. When we were born into this world, we were born an enemy of God, according to the scripture. And God knew that there must be something that would reconcile his creation back to him. So he said, I am going to allow my only son Jesus to die on this cross and bleed and suffer. And I'm going to bear the sins of the world on his shoulders. And I will not be able to look at him because he will be saying God, that God is so holy. He cannot have sin in him in his presence. And for a second, Jesus was alone on the cross. Alone with your sin and my sin. And what that action did justified us, made us. He imparted righteousness to us by faith through the work of the cross. Can I get an amen? Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For the wages, Romans 6, 23, of sin. For the payment of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God wants us to remember how he died because we're not justified by his life. We are justified by the work of the cross. Y'all got to know this. Y'all got to know to Give the Lord a hand. Y'all got to get this in your heart this morning. I want you to remember me for what I did on Calvary. In the same way, also he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Well, that's disgusting. That's gross. That's, we don't want to talk about blood. We don't want, but it was without the shedding of blood, there was no emission or remission of sin. There was no blotting. Of, something had to die in order for somebody else to live. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want you to take you back to Jeremiah 600 years before Christ came on this earth. 600, Jeremiah prophesied, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. I talk about it when we do the Lord's Supper. What, what they did when they, when they were ushered out of Egypt, out of bondage, is in parallel to what we as in sin, bondage, slaves to sin, Jesus Christ ushered us out through his blood. The same thing happens here. He said, but not like that. Oh, no, no. It's going to be better. 
He says, my covenant that they broke, and then he puts a little something, something in there, just for all of us who have gone through a divorce. He says, though I was their husband. See, even our Heavenly Father knows what it's like to have a marriage go south. And yet, he still loved me. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I want to go back for just a moment, and I want you to understand the process that took place with the children of Israel. Because he says, I'm going to do it a different way. Well, how did they do it the old way? The Bible calls the covenant in the Hebrew word berith. I don't know that I said it right, but there it is, Ori County lingo. And he also said karat, karat berith, to cut a covenant. And in order to do so, there had to be a covenant was a binding agreement between two people. And what they would do is if they were to cut a covenant like David and Jonathan did in, in, in the scriptures, they cut a covenant. They made a covenant with each other. George, if I was to make a covenant with you this morning, I would say let's make a covenant together. And it would be agreed upon. And so we'd go out and we'd find a, a, an animal and we would take that animal and we would cut it in half. I know that's jacked up, but something has to die. And we would place one part of the animal on this side and one part of the animal on this side and you and I together would lock arms and we would walk through death together. And we would say to ourselves, if I break this covenant... May I be the dead animal that we are walking through. But God said, I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to do it a better way. That was the old covenant. Now I'm going to make it once and for all. And so he, the Bible, you know, it was something I was studying this morning. It's like, you know, the Bible was specific that not one bone of Jesus' body was broken. But we talk about the breaking of bread and how that's supposed to symbolize Jesus' body. But yet it wasn't broken. But when God in his glory and he gave his son Jesus who was all 100% God, all 100% man, was broken away from glory for a time to be that once and for all sacrifice. He did not give up his deity. He wrapped himself in humanity for you and I. And he said this will be the new covenant in my blood. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, not of church attendance, not of helping little old lady cross the street, not of giving so much to the poor more than anybody else. None of that matters. None of those good works mean anything. They're as filthy rags. You and I could do nothing Nothing to impart the righteousness of God on us. It had to be the death of Christ on the cross. He said, this is my covenant in my blood. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with all that you got. And then he goes on and says, let a person examine himself. When I read this verse, is that me? Is that me? Sorry. He says, when I, I'm examining my inability to use the clicker. He says, let a person examine himself in the courtyard of the tabernacle. Y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. In the courtyard of the tabernacle, when you cross through the gate, through the tabernacle, through the courtyard, there was one way in and one way out of the tabernacle, the, into, the, into, the, into the courtyard. That was the eastern gate. Just outside of the eastern gate was the tribe of Judah, which Jesus Christ came from, by the way. And all the millions of other tribes and other people are surrounded the tabernacle. You walk in, the first thing you see is the brazen altar. And that priest would take that 
that animal that was sacrificed for the sins of the people on the day of atonement and he would take that lamb and he would tie it to the four horns that were on that altar and all of that is prophetic and every bit of that is a picture of Christ all four corners east north south west everything this death was for all and they would sacrifice that animal and then that priest would take a big old laver of it and he would carry that blood and he would go to the next piece of furniture just outside the tabernacle and that piece of furniture was called the brazen laver and it was made out of bronze pure bronze it was given to by all the women in the in the Jewish community community they were bringing all of their things to make this and it was and it was almost as if you could see your reflection in the brazen laver and before the priest could go in to do the priestly duties he would set down that laver of blood and he would wash his hands and he would wash his feet and we find that the Word of God shows us so clearly that the Word of God is what helps in the moments of the process of sanctification in our life although the death of that animal of Jesus Christ was once and for all we are saved by the blood of Jesus but as a child of God we are gonna trudge through this jacked up world this broken torn up world and our hands and feet are gonna get dirty and from time to time we must open up the Word of God and let it examine our heart Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Prove yourself. The word means to scrutinize yourself. That's why I check yourself or you wreck yourself. That's where it came from right here. Or do you not realize this about yourself that Jesus Christ is even in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I don't give the test. You don't test me. I don't test you. We are tested by the Word of God. It is through the Word and that process of sanctification. Although justification was once and for all in our life at salvation, the process of sanctification is a daily, daily process through the Spirit of God working in your life, walking you step by step this is what Paul was trying to get at when he said you need to recognize the Lord's Supper for what it truly is I gave all remember me what were they doing they were coming to church getting fat and drunk calling it a spiritual occasion Paul said I want to throw up he says examine your heart church you and I, we must examine ourselves, not by, by the person that's sitting next to you, but by the Word of God. James says, but be doers of the Word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. Nobody wants to be deceived. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, just like that priest would look in the mirror of that brazen laborer as he's washing realizing this is way bigger than me there's no way I can I can meet up to the holiness of God I can't imagine Aaron the high priest walking behind the veil where the holy of holies was where God rested he was in that I wouldn't want to do that they had to tie bells around his waist because if he messed up and touched that Ark of the Covenant he would drop dead because you can't touch holiness That's what Aaron had to do. And so what he would do is he would take that blood from the sacrifice, the first piece of furniture, and he would pour it over the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And God in his glory, would, in his Shekinah glory, would devour that blood. And you know Aaron's so excited. He's got to make sure he steps out just right. He doesn't want to knock something over, get smitten like Uzziah did. And he's making sure real careful. And he runs out, and he's like, and he screams, It is finished! Just like Jesus did on the cross, that one ultimate sacrifice. 
and all the people would shout on that day of atonement and they would get jiggy with it and they would have them a dance and they were like, whoa, for one more year, our sins are atoned. But the cross. See, we no longer have a high priest of flesh and blood. Jesus Christ was the last and final one. And he said, your sins are covered because of what I did. That's the Lord's Supper that we remember. That's what we commune together. Not separately, haphazardly. Let's bring a pizza. Let's over here have us a, a, a bottle of wine and let's, let's get tipsy and then look at each other like we, we got something going on, like we something special. No. Look at what he says here. For the he that looks himself and goes away at once and forgets what he's like, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. What is that? Well, I'll show you what it is. It's just right here, the word of God. When we look at God's word and we measure our heart and our life to the word of God, not by Susie Q or Johnny B down the street, but by the word of God. Not social media, not cultural whatever stuff that Facebook, Bluetooth, whatever. I don't know what y'all call that stuff today, but it ain't none of that. The, the word of God. Bluetooth. I know what that is. I'm just trying to be, you know, whatever. He said, examine yourself. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 11, 33, he closes out with this. He says, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Tarry with one another. We come together. Y'all seen how we do it? We come in for orderly fashion. We take care of it. We get the little juice, little grape Welch's juice, and we get the bread, and, and we sit down, and we're, we're all together, and we have a word of prayer. And what do I encourage you to do? Search your heart. Speak to the Lord. Get anything out of your heart and life that needs to be dealt with. If you've got unforgiveness with a brother or sister, put it down, go deal with that, and then come back and offer it up. But make your heart right. Don't take it unworthily. And for heaven's sake, if you don't know Christ, don't do this at all. This is for the believer to remember what Jesus did on the cross. He says, wait for one another. He closes out chapter 11 with unity. It started with, I see there's division, but let's end it with unity. Church, we have got to be unified. We have got to work together. Next chapter, next week, we're going to break down chapter 12 and the spiritual gifts. And we're going to talk about these things. And we're going to talk about the importance of them. And we're going to take our time. But I want you to realize something. It is a, it is a we here. There is no Pastor Scott. There's, I don't, my personality does not run this church. If you're looking to link up with the preacher to get in row, that ain't here. We aren't here for us. We are here to magnify the name of Jesus. And so forth, our action ought to represent who Christ is in our life throughout the week. I'm done. I think I am. Yep, that was the last slide.